Good afternoon, everyone. In case you're a little confused, I am most definitely not Bob Ribbon. Uh, Bob was meant to introduce this event, but he is in New York for the uh, memorial service of his friend and colleague, Pete Peterson. Uh, he sends his regrets, and he asks that I fill in for him today. So I am Ted Geyer. I am the Executive Vice President here at Brookings. I also have the pleasure of serving on the Advisory Council of the Hamilton Project. And just as an aside, I'm noticing a bit of a trend. Three years ago today, well, not today, about three years ago, I was standing up here filling in for Larry Summers because he was attending the memorial service of one of his friends. So apparently there's a market for being a stand-in for former Treasury secretaries while they attend funerals. Uh, I worked for Hank Paulson. He is yet to call, but, you know, who knows. Uh, nonetheless, it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to our forum on Beyond Reading and Math, How to Accelerate Student Success, which is co-hosted by the Hamilton Project and the George W. Bush Institute. Access to quality education is a key contributor for positive economic outcomes. It increases human capital and productivity, leading to improved living standards. Today's event is on the important issue of chronic absenteeism. There are 6.8 million students in the US who are chronically absent each year, meaning they have 15 or more absences during the school year, and who have worse outcomes across a range of educational metrics, including a higher dropout rate. Uh, I was reading an article by Washington Post reporter Pachula Dvorak just the other day on the current state of the D.C. public school system, which is, uh, has some recent controversy. The, the first few lines uh, said it much better than certainly an economist like me can say it, and so I'll quote her. The building blocks of a prosperous and healthy society are pretty simple. Education, education, and education. And on this front, our society is in peril. End quote. In a new Hamilton Project paper released today, the authors Jay Shamba, Lauren Bauer, and Patrick Liu of Brookings, along with Diane Schazenbach of Northwestern University, describe evidence-based strategies for schools to consider implementing as they work to reduce rates of chronic absence among students. This paper follows work by Diane and Lauren that the Hamilton Project published in 2016 recommending that chronic absenteeism be adopted as a key school accountability measure. We look forward to exploring uh, this issue today, uh, both chronic absenteeism and the more broadly school accountability during our discussion. I should add personally, uh, I've served, I served both in the Council of Economic Advisors and the Treasury Department during the George W. Bush administration, so I'm particularly enthusiastic about the partnership we have here today between the Hamilton Project and the George W. Bush uh, Institute. School accountability was an important issue during the Bush administration, continues to be an important issue for the Bush Institute. I'm thrilled to have their voice here today on such an important issue, and I'm delighted that Holly Kuzmich, executive director of the George W. Bush Institute, has joined us for today's event. Uh, last year, uh, here at Brookings, we hosted Education Secretary Betsy DeVos for a public forum. Today, it's our pleasure to welcome a key member of her team, Jason Battelle, who is on his way, I've been told, uh, along with all of our distinguished panelists and moderators this afternoon. I will not recite all of their impressive resumes since you should have them with you in your programs. I'll just express uh, on behalf of myself and on Brookings my gratitude for all of them for joining us today. So with that, I am going to turn the lectern over to my colleague, Jay Shamba, to start the session, although I'm signaling, am I turning it over to the right player, person? I'm going to turn it over to somebody of authority. <laughs> oh, Jason is here. Oh, terrific. Jason Botel, thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry for the uncertainty there. Um, been some schedule changes, but very happy to be here. I'm very happy to see you all, so thank you very much for having me. Um, it's definitely an honor to, to be with you all today. Um, I want to start by applauding the teams from Brookings Hamilton Project and the Bush Institute for convening this important conversation and for your research and resources to support new and deeper approaches to accountability, including two new tools released today. I'm especially grateful to the state and local practitioners on the panel and in the room. 
I want to thank everyone here for being thought leaders and committed partners in the most important work of our time, preparing every student in America from every background and circumstance for success in the 21st century. So much of the future of our country, how prosperous we will be, how secure we will be, how much access to opportunity every American will have depends on this work. A few weeks back, Secretary DeVos joined her predecessors and other distinguished speakers at the Reagan Institute Summit on Education. The summit's purpose was to assess our progress on the 35th anniversary of the release of the seminal report, A Nation at Risk. To be sure, the assembled researchers, practitioners, and policymakers could point to some promising programs and practices. But, as Secretary DeVos emphasized, the conclusion was clear. For all the urgency that the report generated, the billions of dollars invested, and decades of well-meaning national reforms, our country is still very much at risk. And that's a sobering message. But from my experience at the local level, it's not a surprise. Real significant gains for America's students require commitment and courage at every level, especially state and local levels. They'll happen through student-centered solutions rooted in the unique needs and strengths of schools and communities and designed by the people who live, learn, and work in those communities. That conviction is why I joined Secretary DeVos at the U.S. Department of Education, to empower state and local innovation so that every student can succeed. Secretary DeVos is challenging us to fundamentally rethink school. Rethink means we question everything, so nothing keeps students from pursuing and achieving their goals. So each student is prepared at every turn for success in their education, careers, and life. I believe now is our best chance in decades to unleash innovation and hold ourselves accountable for actions that dramatically improve outcomes for our students. In passing the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, Congress made clear that the U.S. Department of Education does not control how states, districts, schools, and educators ensure that every student succeeds. Every state, community, and educator needs to tailor instruction to meet the unique needs of every student. All students need learning environments that are agile, relevant, and exciting. And every student deserves a customized, self-paced, and challenging lifelong learning journey. To that end, ESSA invites each state to determine what type of support to provide schools that are struggling and how to allocate resources to ensure that every school improves. ESSA also empowers the U.S. Department of Education to help states explore accountability, like an innovative assessment pilot, which allows states to field test new assessments with subsets of students without double testing them. At the department, we look forward to working with Louisiana, New Hampshire, and Puerto Rico on their re recent applications to participate in this program. Moreover, just as we're empowering states to innovate, states must empower local innovation, and districts must empower innovation within their schools and among their educators. When teachers and principals have the power to personalize instruction to meet students' individual needs, every student can succeed. I've spent most of my waking hours over the past year overseeing the review of state ESSA plans, the development and communication of peer and department feedback about those plans, and recommendations to Secretary DeVos to approve plans once they have met all statutory and regulatory requirements. So far, she's approved 39 of 52 plans, including those from District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. We're working with the remaining 30 states who requested additional time to revise their plans, and we'll approve them as soon as we have determined that they meet all statutory and regulatory requirements. In the end, the crucial test of these shared efforts will be this. Do student outcomes improve for every student? ESSA, as compared to its predecessor, NCLB, offers far greater latitude for state accountability systems to incorporate more than test scores. Each state is required to develop long-term goals and measurements of interim progress for academic achievement, graduation rates, and the progress of English learners in attaining English language proficiency. Each state must also set goals for all student subgroups required by the law. In addition, each state must have at least one indicator of school quality or student success. States have broad discretion in developing these indicators, which must be comparable, statewide, valid, reliable, and able to be disaggregated for each subgroup. I've had to repeat those words many, many times. Um, and as states innovate, which is great, we've worked really hard to make sure that each of these new indicators meets all of those, comparable, statewide, valid, reliable, and able to be disaggregated for each subgroup. At the same time, we believe these plans are not a ceiling but a floor. We hope that many states will, over time, go far beyond the fundamentals of the law in support of students. And as, as everyone in, in the room knows, while these terms can sound dry and analytical, they help to describe education's impact on real students' lives. I appreciate the Bush Institute's series of interviews with education leaders on accountability, pithily titled The A Word. 
Uh, and I have some, a couple of quotes from what we've seen there. Here's what Denver Public Schools Superintendent Tom Bozberg had to say. Quote, you can't have students first, integrity or equity, without accountability. Unquote. And I agree. If we're not putting students first in all we do, we don't have real accountability. The theme of today's session is accountability beyond reading and math, and that's appropriate, given S's focus on expanded measures. Still, let's agree at the start that reading and math are and must remain fundamental. The law keeps that balance right, requiring that the four academic indicators receive substantial weight individually and much greater weight in the aggregate than the school quality and student success indicators. That's important because, according to the recently released 2017 National Assessment of Educational Progress, our reading and math scores continue to stagnate, unfortunately. And it's especially troubling that the gap between the highest and lowest performing students is widening, according to those results. So we can't take our eyes off the ball on reading and math. New accountability measures can't be an either-or proposition. We need strong focus on reading and math and additional indicators. I learned the hard way as a school leader that when you only look at reading and math, you lose sight of other important measures of how well students are being prepared for success. When it comes to the school quality and student success indicators, many states are adopting chronic absenteeism. And I really appreciate that the Hamilton Project's new strategy paper addresses the possible strengths of using this as an indicator and also includes some important cautions in using chronic absenteeism as an indicator. Some states are looking at proficiency or growth in science or social studies in addition to the required academic achievement indicator for reading and math. And many have chosen to include indicators of college and career readiness. In our review of state plans, we've seen some include specific measures such as access to and performance on advanced coursework like advanced placement, international baccalaureate, or dual enrollment options. Others like Delaware and North Dakota have chosen to develop more comprehensive approaches that include multiple pathways for students to demonstrate that they are college, career, or military ready, using tools like the ACT, SAT, or Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. Still others are looking at participation in career programs, like those that lead to career and technical certifications or internship placements. A few states, such as Connecticut and Michigan, have also chosen to include post-secondary readiness indicators, as measured by enrollment or course completion data. It's helpful that today the Bush Institute is issuing a college and career readiness spotlight with analysis, case studies, and insights from a wide range of experts. Because in the end, the true test of accountability is how we use the ed indicators to improve the educational opportunities we offer students. In her A-Word interview, Diane Tavener, CEO of the Summit Public Schools Charter Management Organization, explained, students need to be prepared to live lives of meaning and purpose. So we look at the skills, habits, and behaviors they need to to be successful in college and beyond our school. Then we hold ourselves accountable by designing tools that help kids get those skills, providing teachers and school leaders with the training they need to enable those conditions, and measuring everything along the way to ensure our students are on the trajectory that we want them to be on." Unquote. So the hard work of implementation, translating plans into action, lies ahead. It will be exciting to see how these new indicators help states and districts focus on schools most in need of support and how those efforts translate into stronger, more positive school climates and improved student achievement. This is an unprecedented opportunity to move decision making as close to students as possible and to empower parents and educators. So here's my challenge to the researchers in the room. Please help us identify the most sound indicators and develop the best data systems to measure them. Help students, districts, and educators measure what matters and translate what we know into better results for kids. And to the practitioners in the room, we encourage you to be innovative and bold. We'll never succeed by making minor changes in struggling schools and hoping for better outcomes. So please don't rest until each of your students is learning in the environment that's best for her or him. We need to strike the balance Dr. Danny King from the Far San Juan Alamo School District in Texas has described. Accountability, he says, calls for patient impatience. So let's be patient in designing and continuously improving accountability systems that help us deliver for students and families. And let's be impatient in driving innovation and accelerating achievement. Our kids and our country can't wait. So now is the time to rethink and to give innovation everything we've got at every school in support of every student's success. And here's my hope, that the provisions in ESSA and states and communities greater freedom to innovate launch a new era of accountability and progress. 
As that happens, we'll gain unprecedented insights into our students' needs and how best to meet them. And we can tailor our responses, personalize teaching and learning, and accelerate student achievement like never before. Then, hopefully, we'll no longer be a nation at risk. We'll be a nation on the rise. Thank you very much for all that you all do. Really appreciate it and look forward to hearing what comes out of your conversations. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.